All right, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, interesting lady, interesting individual. Um, I think a lot of the uh, interest, uh, and especially the significance of her poem and uh, you know, her relationship with her husband uh, is even that much more special because of how she was hampered uh, by her father. Uh, kind of overprotective, would you say? A little bit. Ladies, would you enjoy that type of treatment? Probably not. I think it would be a fair statement. Um, and just imagine you know, you, your self-esteem, your shelteredness. Um, that's even appropriate way to say shelteredness. Um, just your, your experience to the outside world would be very, uh, very hindered. And you wouldn't be able to you know, feel like somebody could actually love you and such. But she eventually got an admirer. And uh, we'll read his, um, his work in a little bit. Um, and they eventually, you know, fell in love and got married against, you know, wishes of father and so on. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, love finds a way, you know, just like life finds a way. Jurassic Park, you know, oh, life, it will find a way. Um, page 940, 941 with her sonnet 43. Um, those of you who read this, the first couple lines should sound relatively familiar. Okay? How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Right? Don't you see that in a movie or cartoon, you know, or he loves me, he loves me not, and they're plucking daisies, you know, or petals, or uh, roses are red, violets are blue. How do I love thee? Let me count. Those are all the kind of generic, um, not that this is generic, but the generic intros to, to love poems and such uh, that you might see in, in, the, in the modern world and such. Um, the little bit of additional backstory. So she, there was a strong love connection between her husband and her, obviously, which you think most marriages are uh, or should have. Um, this poem was not meant to be printed. A little bit of a backstory. That's, that's kind of neat. Okay, one of the most famous poems here is, was never intended to be, to, to be read by other people, let alone students, you know, 150 years later. Um, it was just one of those things, a little note to put in, uh, put in her husband's pocket. Um, you know, when you were a kid, did, did you ever pack your lunch to school? Or did your mom ever do that, or your dad? Did they ever slide little notes in there? Little things like, I love you. Those aren't meant to be published. Okay, my wife puts little things like that in my uh, my kids' stuff every once in a while. It's a nice little surprise for them. Um, I got one with some beanie weenies once. It was pretty sweet. So she cares, um, and I love beanie weenies. So big fan. Um, so, anyways, uh, this one here just put a little note in. But the husband thought it was so wonderful that you know he was collecting them, keeping them, and said, "You should print these. You should publish these. They're great." And she was even being de deceptive about that, where she gave it the title, The Collected Works, The uh, Sonnets from the Portuguese, hoping that people would think the poems were translations rather than expressions of her own emotions. So hopefully people would read them and think, oh, well, something was translated weird. That's why, it, you know, it's not really her emotions. Um, and so she was kind of trying to protect herself because she was being, she was putting herself out there. She was very vulnerable because what if it gets slammed and critiqued and people hate them? It, she wasn't trying to please those people. That, that's truly how she feels, and she didn't want to necessarily be hurt, open herself up to, the, to that, um, that, that criticism. Okay? Um, the literary element of repetition, uh, just skim down the left-hand side of the stanza. Just look at that. You see the repetition. It's obvious. The I love thee. Okay, I love thee. The, the obvious repetition of certain words, certain phrases, tend to really push the point of that piece. And it is not an accident. Do you guys think it's an accident when, you watch in, when you're watching TV and there's back-to-back -back commercials, they were exactly the same? Have you ever seen that? It's the same way like, <laughs> somebody screwed up. Do you think they screwed up? Absolutely not. McDonald's paid to have the same bit McRib commercial, back, and I love McRibs as well, the same McRib commercial back-to-back. To reiterate, maybe somebody was missed the end. Maybe you're flipping through the channels and you missed it. Maybe you were sitting there watching the game and you're watching both commercials. You're like, I just saw that. Oh, yeah, McRib. Mm, I'd really like a McRib. Maybe we'll go there after the game. Ideally, that's what McDonald's would want you to think. Okay? Um, so repetition, they don't make mistakes. Okay, that, especially with the commercials, it's so expensive. Especially when it gets to Super Bowl time. There's always a news story about how much 30 seconds costs. And I've watched over the last 20 years just go up. What was last year? A couple million, at least. At least. At least. Um, so sign at 43, um, page 941. Just follow along, please. Sonnet 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. How do I love thee? 
Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Okay, so is this is a love poem. I think we obviously get that. Not a whole bunch of analysis needed in this, okay? Um, literary element of repetition I wanted to focus on. Um, just the, I love thee freely, I love thee purely, I love thee with a passion. Um, at the very end, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Um, so, you know, hopefully if things go well, we go to heaven, everything's great. I love you, love you, love you. Everything's wonderful. Maybe we can have our eternal love in heaven, should God choose, okay? Um, but the love is continuing, continuing, and it's just... And, and remember, from her history, what we read a little bit ago, don't you think she really, really, really does love him? She probably thought she was going to be an old maid with cats. Have you seen The Simpsons with the cat lady? Kind of the crazy, kooky one, and she just has cats. It's weird. She doesn't necessarily believe, because of her history and her health issues and such, that she was going to have or find somebody to love her for her. And he loved her because of her verse, of her poetry. And he fell in love with the person who came up with those words. So it's a really kind of a, a sweet thing. Um, so any earth-shaking revelations about this thing? No. But it's just a, a strong love poem that should mean a little bit more to us knowing the background information about her. Okay? Would we have been able to tell us a love poem without knowing anything about Elizabeth? Yes. Does it have a little bit greater sense now? Yes. Remember when we talked about... Uh, Thomas Wyatt, one of the first sonnets, okay, when he talked about uh, with Anne Boleyn, they were the former kind of boyfriend, girlfriend, lovers type thing, and, you know, it made more sense since we knew that they was really Anne Boleyn they were talking about and not dear. And Julius Caesar was not Caesar, it was Henry VIII. And so it made a lot more sense to us. Okay, that's why knowing a little bit about the history, the historical significance at the beginning of our units, that stuff plays out.